أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي له ما في السماوات وما في الأرض وله الحمد في الآخرة وهو الحكيم الخبير والصلاة والسلام على المبعوث إلى كافة الورى بشيرا ونذيرا وداعيا إلى الله بإذنه وسراجا منيرا أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآله وعلى أهل بيته أئمة الهدى ومصابيح الدجا الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرز وطهرهم تطهيرا اللهم صل على محمد وآله أما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قالوا سمعنا فتى يذكرهم يقال له إبراهيم صلوا على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد Respected elders, brothers and sisters in Islam, السلام عليكم ورحمة الله الحمد لله We have been provided with another opportunity to gather like this and to remember the great personalities that have shaped the course of history. And indeed, these gatherings provide us with an opportunity to learn from their great example. But not only that, we find that these opportunities are there for us to, in fact, increase the capacity that we have to receive extra divine mercy. For indeed, the Holy Prophet Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Wasallam In a hadith, he states that عِنْدَ ذِكْرِ الصَّالِحِينَ تَنْزِلُ rahmah. When the Salihin and the righteous ones are remembered, mercy descends. So what is the connection between remembering righteous people and the descending of mercy? Why should it be that when we remember such great personalities, mercy descends? Well, there's a wonderful explanation put forward by the renowned scholar Mullah Faid Mohsin Qashani. And he puts it like this. He says that the relationship is such that when we remember the Salihin, the righteous people, what is happening is that we are actually taking them as our role models. And when we do so, we remember their virtues, we try to emulate them in some way, and we try to follow their way of life. This effort in trying all of this, in remembering them and trying to be like them, increases the capacity of our hearts to receive extra mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because we are taking a step towards Him in a way, by remembering these great personalities, and by trying to emulate them somehow, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala regards this as being something extremely valuable. And in this way, we increase and we prepare the foundation to receive extra mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why in the tradition it is said that when the Salihin are remembered, the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala descends. So ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Now, following the birth of the ninth holy Imam, Imam Muhammad al Jawad al Taqi, Salawatullah wa Salamu alayhi, whose birthday we have gathered here to celebrate. Following, following his birth, his holy father, the eighth holy Imam, Imam Ali ibn Musa Rida, Salawatullah wa Salamu would make it a point to constantly refer to his blessed son as the blessed infant. He would make it a point to say this to as many people as he possibly could, to introduce the ninth holy imam as the blessed infant. An example of this is reported in a tradition that once when the ninth holy imam was brought to his father, at that time, he was still a, an infant. The ninth holy imam addresses him uh, or refers to him in this way. He says, هذا المولود الذي لم يولد مولود أعظم بركة على شيعتنا منه. This means that this mawlud, this newborn child, 
There has not been any newborn child who is a greater blessing for the Shia than him. This is truly a remarkable statement. We don't have this with regard to any other Imam, where the father of that Imam refers to his newborn child in such uh, an amazing way, and so often as well. In fact, it is reported in history that he would <coughs> refer to his blessed son in this way so much and so often that actually it became well known that the ninth holy imam is the blessed infant. He became known as this Mawlud Mubarak, this blessed infant. In fact, we get an idea of this, of how well known it was amongst the people, especially amongst the Shia, in another report which is narrated by two people in fact, Ibn Asbat and Abad ibn Ismail. They say that we were with Imam Raza alayhi salam in Mina. And again, on that occasion, the ninth holy Imam, Imam al Jawad, was brought to, the, to his father. At that time, we see that they referred to the blessed infant in the same way. So they asked the Imam, Hadal Mawlud al Mubarak, is this the blessed infant? You see, because it was so well known and because the eighth holy Imam had introduced his son so much as this blessed infant, people began to title him and call him in this way. Is this the blessed infant? The Imam reply, replies, Naam, Hadal Mawlud Ladi, Lam Yulud Fil Islam, A'damu Barakatan Min. In a similar type of way as he did before, he says, Yes, this is the blessed infant, and there's been no newborn infant that is more blessed in Islam than him. So we see all of this emphasis. Now, the question arises that in terms of analyzing this, why did the eighth holy Imam place so much emphasis? Why did he make it such an important point for him to introduce his son in this way and so often? number of reasons have been put forward by the scholars of history, but the one that I would like to put forward is as follows, and I think this is probably the best <coughs> analysis of this whole circumstance of introducing the Imam in this way. And that is because it was very difficult for the Eighth Holy Imam to introduce his son to the people. Why was it difficult? For this there were two main reasons. First of all, there was the existence of the group known as the Waqifiyya. The Waqifiyya were those people who believed that after the martyrdom of the seventh holy Imam, Imam Musa Qasim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they believed that in fact the Imam, the seventh holy Imam, had not died, but he had simply gone into a ghaybah, into an occultation, and that he was the Mahdi who would come and establish justice in the world at the end of time. So they from the outset denied the Imamah of the Eighth Holy Imam. And they believed that the Imamah stopped at the Seventh Holy Imam. This is why they are called the Waqifiyya. Because the root word from Waqf and the Waqf, it means to stop. So they were called the Waqifiyya because they stopped their belief in Imamah at the seventh holy Imam. They did not take it further than that. So that was one reason why it was so difficult for the eighth holy Imam to introduce his successor, the next Imam, to society. Apart from that though, the second reason is the fact that Imam Rida did not have a child until relatively late on in his life. He was actually 48 years of age when he had uh, Imam al-Jawad. And therefore, that was a very late time, relatively speaking, for him to introduce the next successor. Now, this of course was ammunition for those who opposed his Imam in the first place, in particular the Waqifiyya. They didn't accept his Imam in the first place. And then, for the Imam not to have a child, when in fact, there were all of these traditions from the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that stated that there would be 12 Imams and 9 of them would be from the progeny of Imam Hussein Alaihi Salam and so this obviously gave them a lot of fuel, a lot of ammunition to again attack the claim of the 8th Holy Imam that of course this is totally wrong, this is 
unacceptable. You don't even have a child to say that you are the Imam and then he will be the next one after you. So therefore, these two reasons, the existence of the Waqifiyya and the fact that the Imam had his first child at such a late, relatively speaking, time in his life, meant that it was very difficult for him to introduce his son to society. And therefore, when he was born, it was even more incumbent and necessary upon him to introduce to everyone as this blessed son, this blessed infant. And therefore, he made it as, as clear as possible that this is going to be the next Imam and my successor. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Now, of course, the Waqifiyya, they would use this to their advantage. In fact, it's reported that one of the leaders of the Waqifis, who was known as al Hussein ibn Qiyama al wasiti he was one of the leaders of the Waqifiyya, he actually wrote a letter to Imam Rida alayhi salam, and he very rudely, in fact, says to him in this letter that how can you call yourself the Imam? As we said, they rejected his Imam completely anyway. But <coughs> on top of that, they would say, uh, he, he said in this letter, that how can you call yourself the Imam when you don't even have a child? The Imam replies to him and he says that, how do you know that I will not have a son? And then he goes on to say, by Allah, a few days and nights will not pass, but that Allah will bless me with a son, and by him, Allah will differentiate truth from falsehood. And this is exactly what happened, of course. After just a few, uh, a short period of time, Imam al-Jawad was born. And in one way, we can say, the birth of this great Imam silenced the, the critics who were there at present and attacking the whole institution of Imama. This is something very significant. His birth actually was something that prolonged the Imama, not just in his physical sense, but also in the minds and the hearts of the people. And this is why we can say that he was indeed referred to as the Blessed Son, even though, in conclusion, even though all the Imams are blessed, but there was something special about the fact that Imam Reza would refer to him as the Blessed Son because of this reason. No other Imam, when he was born, faced these, type of, these types of problems. And so this was quite a unique situation, although all the Imams are blessed, of course, but because of these particular and unique circumstances, this is why Imam Reza salam, had to introduce him in this way. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Now, of course, at that time, the Imam, the ninth holy Imam, was the youngest Imam to have been born. I say at that time because later on, of course, there was an Imam born, uh, or an Imam who came to the station of Imam, let's put it that way, at an even younger age, and that is, of course, our twelfth holy Imam, Imam Hujjah, Ajallahu Ta'ala, Farajah Sharif. But when Imam Jawad was born and he became the Imam. He was the youngest one to reach the station of the of, of Imam at the age of seven and four months. Now, before I take this further, I would just like to very briefly <laughs> explain some possible, if you like, uh, the, the wisdom behind the appointment of young Imams. Because this is something that is we are often criticized about especially by those who do not adhere to our school of thought, that how can you say that your Imams, at least three of them, the ninth Imam, the tenth Imam, and the twelfth holy Imam, how can you say that they reach such an important station of Imama, of leadership of the whole community at the age of seven, and in the case of the twelfth holy Imam, when he was not even five years of age? Three possible reasons we can put forward or the philosophy, or the wisdom behind this. First of all, simply, it's a test. It's a test for the people. That are they still going to believe in the imama of a young child? Are they still going to maintain their faith, even though it is something quite unusual to have you know, such a young person leading the ummah? So that's the first possible wisdom, you can say, or philosophy behind having young imams. 
A second reason, though, is that to prove the fact that these virtues that these imams had, they were not acquired. Rather, they were virtues, these great blessings. They were something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed these people with. If all the imams had become imam when they were adults, there were no exceptions to this at all, then possibly it could be argued that, well, these were just very talented people. These were people who were, if you like, geniuses. They attained all of these virtues and this knowledge by themselves. This is not God-given. This is not something special. This is not something divine. We have examples of history of such geniuses, of very virtuous people. Perhaps, just like them, they also acquired them over the normal course of their life. But by having <laughs> such intelligent, pious, virtuous role models at this young age, it was clear that this is a type of miraculous, divine, sort of like blessing given and, a, and an appointment by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to these young infants. And thirdly, we can say the wisdom behind having imams at such a young age is to show that imama, the station of imama, it is based on the worthiness of a person. It is nothing to do with factors such as age or ethnic background or social status. It is purely based on the worthiness of a person. And therefore, it doesn't matter if the person is young or old. If they are worthy to become the leader, to become the divine guide of, the, of mankind, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will appoint them as such. Just to illustrate this a bit further, there's this wonderful incident that takes place with regard to the great uncle of Imam al-Jawad. So he, this person, Ali ibn Ja'far, he was the brother of Imam Musa al-Qazim. So that makes him the great uncle of the ninth holy Imam. This is an example that shows someone who perfectly understood this. The fact that Imam is given to the person who deserves to be appointed to that station. It's not something that is dependent on age or any other factor. He understood this very well and he demonstrated this practically to his companions. What happened was that one day when this Ali ibn Ja'far was sitting in the uh, mosque of the Holy Prophet in Medina, he was with his companions. At that time, the ninth holy Imam came into the masjid. Immediately, Ali ibn Ja'far, he, he gets up, he jumps up, and without even putting on his shoes, without even putting on his cloak, he goes towards the Imam, he takes his hand, he kisses his hand, and he, he starts showing him all of this respect. Now, Imam Jawad, he turns to his great uncle and he says, Oh uncle, take a seat, please sit down. Ali ibn Jafar replies to him, How can I sit when you are standing? Not only that, but when he shows him all this respect, he then afterwards goes back to his companions. His companions, they start scolding him. They start having a go at him, saying that, how can you do all of this? Look at your age, look at this person's age. You are the brother of his uh, grandfather, basically. And look at the difference in age. How can you do this? How can you show all of this in front of everyone? He demonstrates the fact that it is purely based on the worthiness of a person. With this wonderful statement, he says that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and at this point he places his hand on his grey beard, he says if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not deem this old man to be worthy of that station, and he deemed this young fata, and I'll come to this word fata, and just for the present time being we'll translate it as young man, and he deemed this young man to be worthy of the station that he has appointed him to, then how can I reject and refuse those virtues of his? How can I pretend that he doesn't have those virtues? virtues? And he says, Na'udhu Billah, may we seek refuge in Allah from what you say. And he says that I am just like a servant to him. I am just like a servant to him. Demonstrating practically to his companions <coughs> this philosophy and this wisdom behind having young Imams that it does not depend at all on age or any other factor. It is simply based 
on the worthiness in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Now this word that he uses to describe Imam Jawad, Imam at taqi the Fata. Fata, as we said, it can be translated as young person, young man. But I would like to link this whole discussion with the whole area of youth leadership and developing young leaders in the community, inshallah. Something, inshallah, and at the end I'll try to give some practical advice as to how we can do this from the life of the ninth holy imam as well. Now, I'd like to develop this discussion by starting with the story that we all know so well about Nabi Ibrahim. Nabi Ibrahim, as we all know the story in the Quran, when the people had left, he takes an axe and he starts smashing up all the idols apart from the big one. So that when they come back, they, they ask him, you know, what happened to all these idols? And he can say, well, ask the big one. He is supposed to be your Lord. He'll be able to tell you and so on and so forth. What happens is they ask, who did this? Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the words of the people at the time, he describes it, uh, Nabi Ibrahim using the same word, Fatah. The actual verse is the one that I recited at the beginning of this lecture. قَالُوا سَمِعْنَا فَتَنْ يَذْكُرُهُمْ يُقَالُ لَهُ إِبْرَاهِيمُ They said that it was a fata, it was a young man who speaks ill of them, meaning the idols, and he is known as Ibrahim. They call him Ibrahim. So this is one instance in the Quran of the use of the word fata to refer to a great personality like Nabi Ibrahim. It's very significant that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in, the, in their words, he does not describe Nabi Ibrahim by using any other word that is there in Arabic to refer to a young person, such as Shab. Shab, he could have used that word as well. It also means youth or a young person, but he chooses to use the word Fatah. Furthermore, in another place, we see that again, a group of people are described in the same way. These are the Ashab al-Kahf, the companions of the cave. In chapter 18, al-Kahf, we see there are two verses in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes these people as fitya. They, fitya is the plural of fata, so youth. In verse number 10 and verse number 13, the amazing thing is, is the repetition of the, of the word um, uh, fitya in the second verse, in verse 13. Let me start with verse number 10. Is awal fitya to ilal kaf. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, when those youths, those fitya, those fatas, took refuge in the cave. Now, normally when we speak, and we have already described a group of people in a particular way, there's no need to call them or to describe them in the same way. We can just say they, those people, them, we don't have to say those youth again. We don't have to repeat the word youth. We've already described them as youth. Here, we're talking about the most eloquent speech, the most eloquent and perfect book that ever existed, the Quran. So if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, just in three verses after this verse, repeats the word fitya, there must be a reason. We wouldn't do it. So certainly, the most eloquent speaker, he must have had a very good reason for doing so. In verse number 13 of the same surah, we see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala repeats the word <coughs> fitya. Innahum fityatun amanu bi rabbihim wa zidnahum huda. They were fitya. He says, they were youths who had faith in their Lord and we increased them in guidance. Now, what is the significance of referring to them again? He could have just said, In the home, Amanu bi Rabbihim. There's no need to say, In the home, Fityatun, Amanu bi Rabbihim. Some of the exegetes have put forward a very beautiful reason. And they say that it is because of the significance of the fact that they were all Fata. They, were, they all had this characteristic known as Fatuwa. Fotuwa we can translate as chivalry. So basically, they were chivalrous. 
so too was Nabi Ibrahim. So now, what these exegetes say is that this quality of chivalry, it had a significant role in them taking this stance against the disbelievers of the time. It played a significant role in the fact that they took this stance, they uprose, and then they went into the cave. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala repeats the word fitya. Now, how can we relate this to the whole discussion of youth development and youth leadership in the community? Well, this is telling us that this quality of futuwa and chivalry is extremely important for any young leader. First of all, with regard to the meaning of the word fatah, now as we said, we've been just translating it so far as young or young man. But when I was looking at this um, in, in a slightly deeper way, I saw that, for example, lexicographers such as Hassan Mustafawi, he has this wonderful word called At-Tahqiq fi Kalamatil Quran al Karim. What he does is he goes through all different dictionaries, sort of like primary dictionaries, old sort of like sources of lugha and words and uh, expressions and then he, he analyzes with them all and then he puts his own final opinion he says at such and such that means that my final opinion having gone through all of these other previous opinions is such in the part where he says at under the word fata he comes with the following conclusion he says that when I look at all of these different uses of the word fata, the root meaning, and how lexicographers have defined it, I conclude that there is, at its core, a meaning of reaching complete maturity. Okay? At the core of this word fata is a meaning of reaching complete maturity. Then he gives examples. He says, for example, fatwa. Fatwa is from the same root as fata. Why is a fatwa called a fatwa? He says the same core meaning is embedded in the root in the word fatwa. Why? Because a fatwa is really a completely mature, thoroughly considered opinion. There's a difference between fatwa and nazar. Nazar is opinion. It's general. Is it mature? Is it considered? Is it well uh, argued? No, it's just general. However, a fatwa is an expert opinion. It's a considered mature opinion on something. In the same way, fata is a mature person, is a mature man. Sharb is general, it's youth. doesn't have to be mature, it's just general. But fata has this embedded meaning at its core of reaching complete maturity. He says that, not just that, well, we can conclude that a fata is someone who is mature, generous, of sound judgment, strong, and he manages affairs well. Now, I'll come to the conclusion in a moment as to how this relates to youth leadership and developing um, and upbringing of children, inshallah, in our community. So now, we see, therefore, that Nabi Ibrahim, he was able to take this position against the disbelievers because he was fata, as he was described by the people. He had this maturity, even though he was young. However, there's something interesting. Can it be said that, okay, we just take the meaning of youth with regard to the Ashab al-Kaf, and just say that, look, don't go down that route of Futuwa and fata in this deep meaning. Just say that they were youth. Something very interesting we find in our traditions is that actually the Ashab al-Kaf were not young at all. It is reported in the traditions and in the history that they were probably of middle age. So, even more significantly is the use of the word fitya for them. They were not even young. Nabi Ibrahim, he was young, you could say. But these were not even young. They were middle age or even older. But still, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes them as fitya. Now, we see that this characteristic of being fatah it really is a, is a manifestation of the attribute Futuwa. Futuwa, as we said, chivalry. In Persian, actually, it is described in a, it is termed in a very uh, beautiful way, Javan Mard. Javan Mard also literally means young man. And Javan Mardi 
is this quality of fotuwa. Again, from the dictionary, we find that fotuwa or chivalry is a combination of characteristics such as courage, honor, loyalty, consideration for others, and sacrifice, and wanting to uphold the truth. We see this in the case of Nabi Ibrahim. He had all of these characteristics. He wanted to uphold the truth. Same goes for the Ashab of Kaf. They had these qualities, courage, honor, loyalty, consideration for others, self-sacrifice, wanting to uphold Haq and the truth. So now, we come to this conclusion that Fudu'wa, it is not related to age at all. A young person can be sharp, but he might not be Fatah. An old person, despite his age, can be Fatah. An old person, if he displays the characteristic of Fudu'wa and chivalry, he can be, de he can be described as being Fatah, as being chivalrous. So now, we have this saying, as you know, you are as old as you feel. But really, from this perspective, if you like, from an Islamic spiritual perspective, it is not you are as old as you feel. Rather, it is you are as old as you manifest the quality of Fudu'wa. And you are as young. The, the more you manifest this, the more young you actually are in the spiritual sense. The more you can manifest this quality of Fudu'wa. So now, let's have a look at how we can conclude with regard to some practical advice, inshallah, and draw this whole discussion to a conclusion. We see that even in the course of history, there were great personalities who were appointed to these positions of leadership. Now, this is something, especially for my younger brothers and sisters, who inshallah will be our future leaders and indeed can take up positions of responsibility even at this young age. We see, for example, Usama, the Holy Prophet, Rasul al-Adham, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He appointed Usama to lead that expedition, despite the protests of some of the companions, especially because he was so young. But the Holy Prophet gave him this responsibility. Why? Definitely because he was Fatah. How about perhaps the greatest and the most famous Sort of like description of a young person using this word Fatah. La Fatah illa Ali. La Saifa illa Zulfika. There is no youth except Ali. There's no Fatah except Ali. And there's no sword except Zulfika. Why? Because of this great quality and manifestation of this brilliant attribute of Fatuwa. So now, when we look at this, we see even in our traditions, for example, from our sixth holy Imam, Imam Jafar Sadiq, this is very beautifully put by him. He encapsulates this whole idea that it's nothing to do with age, it's to do with this manifestation of this quality of chivalry. He says that the best of your youth are those who act like your adults. The best of your youth are those who act like your adults. And then he goes on to say, And the worst of your adults are those who act like your youths. So the best of the youth are those who display this quality of Fudu'wa. They have this maturity. They have this intellectual and spiritual maturity. Just like you, you normally uh, accustom adults to have. Whereas the worst of the adults are those who are like the youth. Meaning youth who do not have this maturity. They act immature. Immature intellectually. Immature spiritually. Finally therefore, just to end with some practical advice again from the life of Imam Jawad Salawatullah Salamu alayhi. How can we try, especially us as parents, especially us as, as community uh, members and adults who can try and uh, raise our children to have this great quality and follow in the footsteps of great personalities such as Nabi Ibrahim and Imam Ali and these great young Imams? 
The example I'd like to give is from a letter from Imam Rida alayhi salam to his blessed son. Now, this letter really gives us so many lessons that we can learn from as to how we can, inshallah, raise our children to have this quality. Of course, there are many pieces of advice and many teachings from the Quran and the Ahl Bayt alayhi salam, but just something that we gain from his blessed life, inshallah, and we can take home uh, with us. The ninth holy Imam, you will recall that he was in Medina and he, his father was in Khurasan. However, amazingly, his father made it incumbent upon himself to maintain this contact with his son. So he would write, a, he would write letters to him in Medina. And in one of these letters that has come to us, he states that, I have come to know that whenever you want to leave, the servants tell you to leave from the small door. Now, he says small door, but really in sort of like contemporary times, we can say the back door. He says, but this is because, the ser because of the servants' stinginess. They don't want you to give charity to people. They don't want people to see you when you leave your house to come to you and ask you for things and then you give them charity. Because of their stinginess, they're telling you to leave from the small door or the back door. But he says, by the right that I have over you. I want you to leave always, whenever you go out, whenever you come in, always use the large door, meaning the, the main door, the front door. And he says that not only that, make sure that when you go and you leave from the front door, that you always have some gold and silver with you. And whenever you go out, make sure that you give people this gold and silver. He even goes on to specify that if one of your uncles asks you for some charity, give them X amount. If one of your aunties asks you for some charity, give them Y amount. He even goes to that level of detail, guiding him. And he says that by Allah, this is because I want Allah to raise you. And do not fear poverty. Do not ever fear that you will, you will somehow become poor. So now... What lessons can we gain from this as parents, as people who want to bring our children up as, as uh, fatahs and fitya? First of all, the fact that it is absolutely essential for us to always main, main, maintain communication with our children. In this particular circumstance, we see that the Imam is in Khorasan, in Iran. The, his son is in Medina. And despite the great distances, the Imam made it a point to maintain this communication with his son. In this day and age, certainly, therefore, we do not have any excuse when we have such, such advanced technology, mobile technology. <coughs> it's so easy with email, with uh, even video conferencing. It's so easy to maintain contact. We have absolutely no excuse to do so. Secondly, look at the emphasis that the Imam places in the letter. <coughs> Does he concentrate on the physical development of his son? Does he concentrate on the material development of his son? He doesn't. What he concentrates on, what he focuses all his guidance on, is the spiritual development of his son. Not only that, in fact, you can say he tells him quite the opposite, something quite non-material. He says that give in the way of Allah. Give charity. Make sure people see you. Make sure they come to you and then you give it to them. So, the second lesson is that not only should we maintain communication with our children, but also we should concentrate as much as possible on their spiritual development. Too often, I personally feel that we concentrate a lot, and of course it's necessary, on things like their, on, uh, for, uh, their sort of like material development, on their social development, for example, their education. Of course, all that goes without saying, that has to be there. There's absolutely no doubt that we have to give importance to that, but not at the expense of their spiritual development. How often is it that parents, especially when they are somehow separated from their children, they've gone to uni or perhaps even, you know, they've, they've gone away for a short vacation. How often is it that we find parents are actually concentrating on spiritual aspects of their children's lives? Who are they keeping company with? What centers are they visiting just because they happen to go to university? Does that mean they stop, uh, they, they cease their connection with the community, with Islamic centers, with Islamic programs? Spiritual advice. How about things like the way they are raising their children? 
So basically, grandchildren, parents can give tremendous advice as to how their children can raise their children. Things like this that we must focus on. And finally, we must always bear in mind that despite all the hardships, there is absolutely no excuse for us not to have good and effective communication with our children. When we bear in mind the great distance and the difficulties that the Imam, the eighth holy Imam was facing in Khurasan, still, you can just imagine how hard it was for him to get letters to a distant place like Medina. But still, he did so, and he did so, so effectively. Inshallah, let's end with a dua. That through the intercession of Imam Al-Jawad, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Bless us all with the tawfiq to raise our children to be fatah, insha'Allah. Oh Allah, forgive us and our forefathers for our sins. Oh Allah, bless the community with strong and effective leadership, insha'Allah. Oh Allah, bring relief to all those who are facing difficulty. And oh Allah, hasten the appearance of our 12th Holy Imam, Ajjalullahu Ta'ala, Barajahu Sharif. Salah Muhammad wa Muhammad. Oh.